Well, good morning. Um, I don't know if you are the types of persons that uh, really read very carefully all the descriptions of the talks and the uh, uh, description of the speakers before uh, designing your, your agenda. Or maybe you are like me, that you just decide based on, on, the, on the titles and more or less the topics that you want to cover. And then some, sometimes I even completely change my mind uh, because I uh, speak with someone at the, at the corridor or at the hall and then he or she tells me that there's something more interesting to do or some, some other talk more interesting. So uh, the point here is that uh, I guess that I'm supposed to introduce myself, but I will just simply say my name. I'm David Gomez. I work as a developer advocate with, uh, for Axonic. A strong emphasis in the developer, because for me, a developer advocate should be first and foremost a developer. So I have a long, uh, a long experience uh, developing software. Now I'm doing some other tasks too. But I'm not going to go into that because uh, you have a full description of my life in the, in the website. If you're interested, you can read those, uh, uh, that. I'm not interested because uh, I don't want to talk about me, but I sometimes really want to uh, like to share uh, stories that happened to me in the past. And I'm going to start with that because last week I had a problem with my bank. It all happened when my kids came from the school saying that they had scheduled a trip uh, for, for with the school to somewhere else. So I had to pay something uh, f in order to then be able to go to the, on that trip. So I opened my laptop, I connected to the, to the bank, uh, uh, bank website, and right before clicking on the wire transfer link, I noticed that something was a little bit off. And that something was the balance of my bank account. And it wasn't a little bit off. What would you do in that case? Well, probably depending if uh, the balance is higher <laughs> of what you expected or lower than you expected. But in, in this case, the balance was way lower of what I expected. To the point that I kind of imagined that my bank, that I was trusting a bank in which I was putting the money and the money was flying away some way uh, from, the, from the back door or something like that. So this is kind of the thing that you cannot solve by uh, trying to reach to anyone using your laptop or using the, the online banking system. The thing is that you need to go to the office and you need to try to speak to someone. So that's exactly what I did. What I did is I went to the office and I spoke to the manager. And basically what she did is basically she checked their systems and she came to me and said, hey, the balance is this one, which was the one that is, was grown, in my opinion. So according to them, uh, the balance was right. So we had a difference here. Luckily, the banking systems have already solved, have, ha they have a tool in order to solve situations like this. And this is a tool that is, was, it's, it's not new, actually. It's something that they invented, they started to use, I think it was back in the 16th century. So it was a long time ago. And this is called a ledger. A ledger is basically a book in which they write all the operations that affect the state of any asset. In this case, my bank account balance is calculated. Well, it's stored somewhere, but it should be calculated based on going through all these annotations written on the ledger. So that's exactly what we did, we went through all the, we asked it, or I asked it to go through all the annotations in the ledger so that we could come up with a final balance and see who was right. Fortunately, we don't need to do this manually anymore because we have computers. So what the office manager uh, did is she called the central office and asked them to remove the registry in the bank, in the table that was keeping my current balance. And they restarted some kind of process that went through all the movements from my bank account to recalculate the final balance. And finally, the final balance was the right one. So we solved that. So this is a more or less a personal story and with a, with a happy ending. But this is actually what we did. And I have also a consideration to share with you because 
the banking uh, sector is actually a good paradigm of how uh, systems have evolved in, in, in computer science. And it's also um, a good paradigm because usually we think that the banking sector is the one that they don't introduce anything new or they need to trust really well at technology before actually putting that into production. But still there are something or there are some, some ways of working that are invented for, from a long time ago. And it's also a paradigm of how systems have evolved. So in the beginning, they had these uh, computers at the office, and they have this simple solution. This is just an abstract diagram. It's not anything concrete. But they started with having computers to help with some minor tasks that the people were running in the office. But as long as they, the, computer, the computers uh, were helpful, they were adding more and more features to those uh, programs and the systems had to connect to different, had to add more, uh, more features. So the small computer servers that they had at the office became kind of, uh, started to become some data centers that uh, the, bankings, the banks had at their headquarters. And still these diagrams started to be more and more complex, they started to grow more complex, especially when the banks started to add more features to their, to their uh, online uh, banking applications. And then when they started to uh, buy some fintechs, they had to connect to new uh, systems. And this meant that those data centers became, became more centralized. And sometimes they even had to connect with applications running in the cloud. So this is a paradigm of how complexity in, in in software systems have evolved. And I'm talking here about distributed systems. Some of you may think that I'm talking about microservice architecture. I'm, think, I'm, I'm speaking about any kind of distributed architecture. When we have this uh, distributed architecture, basically what we uh, diagram is a set of different modules that are running independently. But at some time, those need to connect to, some, to, to others because they need to they need to collaborate in order to accomplish, to accomplish some, some common task. And still, these different modules are write, written and designed independently. But they need to collaborate somehow. And the problem com comes when uh, we need to implement those collaboration mechanisms. I have a colleague that uh, he usually says that when we start with a diagram like this, we usually, uh, everything works fine, and we draw these arrows, and these arrows, we think that they are going to work perfectly. And then when we need to implement those arrows, then is the moment in which we can start feeling the pain of implementing those arrows. So that's what he called the pain of, uh, of an arrow, the pain of implementing an arrow, because then, you have to start dealing with some considerations to, like how this communication is going to be implemented and designed. It's going to be synchronous or asynchronous. And that means that there are different things that we need to take into consideration. For example, with synchronous communication, we have this um, cool feature that is called consistency. Everything is going to work together very well. But at the same time, we have some kind of coupling in terms of timing, in terms of availability, because all the components involved in a communication should be uh, connected, should wait for others to complete in order to be able to complete their own task. And also, if some of them crashes, the whole chain of operations is going to crash too. So we need to be prepared to, uh, to that. And as the systems grow more complex, we start to lose the track of all this chain of dependencies. So the alternative is usually using asynchronous communication. And asynchronous communication means that we will have to deal with eventual consistency, but at the same time, we are decoupling a little bit more these, these components. So traditionally, the different options that we have had in order to do that is uh, in the very ancient times, we had RMI or RPC which uh, provided the higher coupling between the components because sometimes that meant that all these components should have been implemented even in the same languages. 
But then we started with these service-oriented architectures, and then we started to implement all sorts of protocols over XML uh, just to try to coordinate. And at some point, someone came, uh, came and said, hey, we are not using just HTTP, and HTTP is going to be simpler. And finally, the last thing is what we call today event-driven architectures, which is basically communicating based, based on events. And that's what we are going to talk about right now. Because basically events is a way of communicating and coordinating all these components in which what we are going to do is we are going to break this direct relationship between the producer and the consumers so that the thing that we are going to do is we are going to emit a message which we are going to call an event from the producer. And somehow that event is going to be delivered at the right time to different consumers that are interested in, in, in it. But this is going to run asynchronously. But that's, that, came, that cam, comes with another, with another re requisite, that we need some kind of infrastructure to manage to deal with all these messages. This is what we call the message brokers. So basically, what we started to do in these event-driven architectures is our producer will basically create some kind of event and will put that event into a bus or into the message broker. And then afterwards, when the producer, when the consumer registers on the startup and connects to the broker, uh, all the, broker, the brokers are going to store all these events for a certain period of time, sometimes forever or sometimes for a long period of time. The producer then, the consumer then connects and it's going to receive in the right order all the events and it's going to react and process those events just to update their own version or their own copy of the model or the state of our system. So that's basically what we are using in the most basic architecture based on events. And that's what we call usually uh, event streaming or that emotion or messages in basic systems, which basically means that the producer and consumer are coordinated through sending some message, some event that represents that something has happened in my system. But the thing here is that the producer keeps their own version of the data model, keeps their own version of the state. So this is independently of the event that have, have been generated to communicate, to communicate with other uh, with other components, with the producers. So the consumers will react and will update their models based on the events that were generated by the producer. But the producer is updating on their own his own version of the model, and those could not be uh, connected. For example, what happens if at some point uh, you realize that the model in the, the balance, in this case, in the producer and in the consumer is different. Then the problem comes with you have two sources of truth. Which is the right one? Because maybe the producer sent an event and crashed it or had some kind of issue when updating his, uh, his, uh, his data model. Or maybe the producer updated the data model and the event got lost somewhere. And which one of these two scenarios is the one that happened in your system? How you can define which is the right one? And the answer is you cannot, because you have two different sources of truth in your system. So instead of this, what we are going to do if we want to use seven sourcing is we are going to force the producer to consume their own events. So the producer is actually going to be a consumer at the same time. And that way, we can guarantee that all the changes in our system globally are triggered by the same source, which are the list of events that I have in my system. So now I have a single source of truth. And the way it works inside the, the producer is basically the producer is going to react to some kind of request, and this request uh, is going to be, we are going to call it a command, but we are going to speak, uh, we will go uh, into that a little bit later. So what we, are, what we are proposing is let's try to have some kind of command handler. And this is actually an annotation that we are using in, in a framework that we have developed, an open source framework that we have developed for Java and Spring Boot. So 
the producer is going to be invoked uh, on that, that command handler, and the command handler is going to validate that request, is going to check that this request is actually something that it could be processed. And as a result of that, the producer is not going to change the state. Its internal state is, go is going to be uh, untouched. The only thing that is going to do the producer in order to accept the request is going to emit that event that represents that we have accepted the change in our system. But also, the producer at the same time is going to define another handler, which is an event sourcing handler. That makes the producer also a consumer of its own events. So that's actually where we are going to receive the same event and we are going to process it and change our internal state. The same way that all the rest of the consumers are configured to do. So now, what we have is the Actually, in our system, the event is considered, or the chain is considered, that has, is affecting the system, that has taken place in the system, once that we, affect, we accept the event that represents that change into our message broker. Then, the only thing that we need to do is, in the command handler, the only responsibility that we have to do is just validate that we can process that, that, that request. And in the event sourcing handler, we are going to actually change the state, the internal state, the same way that other consumers could do. So that's actually how a system that is working with event sourcing works. All the components, both producers and consumers, are reacting to the same set of events. So now we can trust that the real source of truth is somewhere in our, on our set of events. So let's, let's try to see an example. Let's uh, see what happens if we are implementing a shopping cart. And the problem with the shopping cart is that if we are storing just the last state of our system, of our entity, in this case, the shopping cart, all we have is just information about the last state. But if we move into an event sourcing system, the kind of information that we are getting is much more complete. Because when the event, the first event that created the shopping cart uh, went and came by, we may up have updated our system to create an empty shopping cart, but we are also storing the event that created the shopping cart. After that, we have uh, an event that represents that the customer added a product to the, to the shop, to the shopping cart, another, uh, another item of the same product. Then the customer added a third product, a different product, and a fourth product, but then at some point we received the event that the customer re removed some of the products and another one, and finally the customer did the checkout. So finally the state is exactly the same one that we had before, but now we have much more information because we, n we n on not only have the information of all the products or the final state of the order, but we also have all the information about what pro, uh, products the customer did consider, but he finally or she finally didn't, didn't buy. And that's very powerful information. Not only that, the thing is that probably the order in which uh, the products were added or replaced are also telling a story. Probably these are two different scenarios that ended up exactly in the same final state, but they are telling probably different stories. And this is something that we should always check with the business people. Because in this case, the products that were removed were products that were added after the ones that he bought. So probably that means that he realized that the shopping cart was too expensive and he or she didn't have enough money, so he decided to remove that. So probably in this scenario, it's much more powerful that we offer some kind of discounts on, this, uh, on these products and the customer will probably buy it. But in that case, probably the products that were removed were the first one. So probably this, I don't know, we, we, we need to, to check this, but probably these are, uh, or the product 42 is a better version of this one too. So it makes no sense in this case to offer any kind of discounts because he or she already have a better, a better product, a better product purchase. So the order sometimes is, is important, but in these kind of systems, it's 
everything an event? Because sometimes components need to collaborate, and sometimes what they do is a component needs to send a message and needs to ask another component to actually do something. And that's actually a different kind of message, because it's basically a request. That's what we call as, as a command. Because the pattern, the routing pattern, is uh, slightly different. And then we also have events, which basically is some kind of notification that from the emitter, from the producer, we want to share with all the people interested. But we don't, uh, we don't mind. It's not important when those consumers are going to receive those messages. And finally, we have a third type of messages, which are the queries, when a component needs actually to retrieve some information from some other component. And then for that, the, the producer needs to know or needs to reach to the components that have the information available. And ne they need to wait for the response to come back. So sometimes we have different kinds of messages. And this means that sometimes uh, uh, event sourcing works very well with two other techniques, which is CQRS and DDD. I'm not going to go into, into detail of that. But what I want to do now is I want to share and show you a little bit of of a demo or how this, this code will work. So um, let's move into our IDE. And one of the things that I'm going to start is I have a shopping cart service. If, uh, do you see the, the code well, especially in the back? Uh, perfect. If you don't know at some point, just uh, raise your hand or uh, yell at me. Uh, so basically, what I have here is uh, a shopping cart service, which basically defines a controller. And in that controller, I have several endpoints, one for create a shopping cart, and then another one to add a product to the cart, to remove a product from the cart, to cancel the shopping cart, or to the checkout. So that's basically the, the, the list of operations that I can, I can provide for my, uh, for my shopping cart. The thing is, the way that I, that I have implemented this, in order to try to make it as easy as possible, is by using uh, our open source framework, which is basically added by adding the Axon Spring Boot Starter. And this is going to come with all set of uh, handlers and abstractions that are going to make easier for me to establish this type of communication. So in this case, one of the components that I can ask uh, Axon to inject into my controller is these two uh, command, these two gateways, the command gateway and the query gateway. These are representations, these are abstractions of the connection with the message broker. Uh, and I can connect to different message brokers, and I can configure which are the right buses for commands and queries. But in this case, I'm asking, uh, then to just inject those uh, command and queries uh, gateways. And when I receive, when I need to implement the endpoint, the only thing that I need to do is validate the request. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the command, and I'm going to put that command into the command gateway for the create shopping cart and also to the add product to cart. So we also have a. Uh, uh, plugin that allows me to because the next thing is okay. This is uh, this is a this is a command. This is an abstraction that adds me a level of indirection. Where are the places in which uh, those commands are going to receive and handle? So we have also for IntelliJ we have a plugin that is going to make it this easier because I can jump directly into the handlers or the components that are going to receive. This, um, this command. And in this case, I'm going to point, because there is some kind of model, there's some kind of entity that is going to keep the track of the different, of the different things. This is basically uh, following the DDD term terminology. This is an aggregate that is implementing the, the shopping cart. An aggregate has its own ident identifier. These are also annotations coming from the, from the Axon framework. And they are basically quite like 
an entity that I will store in the in the in a repository, in a regular repository. But in this case, the semantics are that these aggregates, these ent entities, are going to be uh, re retrieved from the store using the event sourcing model, which we are going to see how how that works. Well, the next thing that we need to add is the command handler, and in the command handler, what we are going to do is basically we are going to add some logic to validate the uh, the, the command, but we are not going to change the state because we don't want to do that. We want to change the state as a result of processing the, uh, the event. So once that the request has been validated, the command has been validated, and we can uh, actually process it, the thing that we are going to do is we are going to send an event, and we are going to do that by using the aggregate lifecycle apply. That means that that's an abstraction that is going to put that they're going to send the event through the message broker. Um, so that's what we have done. And again, I can see who are the different components that are going to react to, that, to this event. In this case, I have two of them. Let's step into this one, which is basically the same. Uh, it's an event sourcing handler on the same producer, on the same module. And in this case, I'm receiving the shopping cart created event. That means that actually that already happened. And then is where I'm going to change the internal state, the internal representation of my model. I'm going to assign the card ID, and I'm going to assign the customer ID. The same happens for the command handler that is going to be invoked whenever I send an add product to cart command. That means that I'm going to validate, and then I'm going to send the event to the message broker. And as a result, I can, I can uh, jump into the event sourcing handler. And the event sourcing handler is going to add that product to the internal representation, to the internal list of products that are part of the, of the shopping cart. So that's basically how it works. Let's try to start the service application. Well, no, not yet. This is not going to, to work yet because I've been talking about sending those commands and events, and I've, I've, I've told that uh, the command gateway and the aggregate lifecycle.send is going to are abstractions over those connectors. Uh, for now, by default, I, can, I could use your favorite message broker. I can configure we have different connectors, but by default, what I'm going to use is our own message broker and even store, which is called Axon Server. I'm going to start Axon Server here. And then once, once it's started, I can uh, basically come here and I can, uh, there we go. Now I see that I have my server, which is a message broker on an event store. We will get back to, to that uh, later on. I can see the different commands or queries that have been uh, or your events that have been sent. Right now, I have none because I have no applications connected and no activity. So the next thing is let's let's start our application. Our application is going to connect to the to Axon server. Now I have my shopping cart service connected, and then that means that. Uh, let's clear the log. Then I can reach out and send a request to create a new shopping cart. And if I see here, first I can see here that first I have sent a command, and I can also check the events. I can see that there was a shopping cart created event that was sent through the event bus. And also, in the logs, I can see here that we received the creating shopping cart co command. We send the shopping cart event, and then after that, we reacted and modified the internal state of our model in the producer. So I can also, I'm going to speed up a little bit. And what I have, I have also a a client application, which basically is going to help me 
uh, calling some these these processes, calling these these endpoints. So what I can ask here, and let me again clean this. What I can do here is basically I can send a by products command. And this is actually going to invoke all these endpoints that I had for creating a new shopping cart, buying a product, removing a product, uh, buying a product, removing the product again. This is a quite uh, un un uh, dubious uh, client. He's not sure of what he wants to buy. But he finally bought the product 66. So let's see how this uh, happened. If I go to my Axon Server console, I can now see that there were a bunch of events happening in the, in the, in the event bus. But actually, if I go back to my service application and I pay attention to the last command that I receive, this is exactly how event sourcing uh, models work in the producer, which basically means that when we receive the request to check out a certain card, the system, in order to retrieve the model, to retrieve the entity, what he did is he went by all the events that happened before. So to recreate the state, he started from scratch. And he first applied all the different events that happened before. Actually, by reacting to that, I could have the final state before applying the last command. So. One of the benefits, uh, and we are going to, to see it afterwards, uh, what if, by having all these events stored, what if after, because if I go here in this model, if I try to count, uh, go, let's see how many events I have in this server, they load type count. I have a lot of events that represents uh, previous purchases and previous activity of my system. It's close to uh, one million and a half events that happened, for example, for product added to cart events. And there was also a bunch of them happening in the shopping cart create. So let's imagine that now we have uh, a new request, a new business feature that uh, the, the business people tell us, hey, I need uh, a way to get all the products that were removed from the cart because I, do, I want to do some kind of analytics or I, can, I, I want to do some uh, offers, some special deals to those customers that remove any product from, from their purchase. So we start implementing that. And by that, the only thing that we need to do is Let's just define a new module, and this module is going to keep a projection, which is going basically to re react to all the shopping cart checked out event, the shopping cart cancel event, and the uh, product removed from cart event, so that we can keep track of that. So the thing is that once that we start this process, We will see that the process is going to start getting all the uh, the messages. Actually, it's processing all the messages, all the previous events, and it's updating the state of our model accordingly. So at some point, I can also send a request to see which are the offers, the product that were removed by this uh, by this uh, consumer. So we are actually adding some uh, new features that can benefit from the past. And with that, I'm going to to move into the next part. Because actually, by using uh, event sourcing, sometimes I can uh, benefit from some of the, of the ideas that are, uh, that are behind uh, behind event sourcing. So the first one is we can 
develop new features, and this is basically the case that I explained. I have a shopping cart, I have an, probably an inventory system that is already consuming those events, but at some point the business people come and say, hey, I need uh, this new feature, we implement that feature, and then we immediately have that feature with all the information from the past. And this is a very uh, specific example, but I'm going to move, try to think in these uh, samples, try to think how they may apply to your different use cases. Because, for example, this is actually a, more or less a real case. I was working a long time ago for a, for a, travel, uh, for a customer that was a travel uh, broker in which they were basically getting all kinds of orders to book flights, to book hotels, to book uh, all kinds of, of uh, things regarding trips and, and holidays. And at some point, we were already having this sales report, but at some point, someone from the business came and said, hey, we have, this, uh, we have seen that there are certain patterns that may correspond to people try to commit fraud on our system, like when they are uh, purchasing a lot of flights on the same dates and they change later on, they change the name, they start changing the name and they end up uh, being sold or resold to other agencies and these are the agencies. So there were several patterns that the business people identified. So they were asking to the technical team to say, hey, could you develop please this new feature so that from now on, when we detect that pattern, we can ban the user or the customer from our system. So we did that, and we deployed the, the new system. The business people didn't know that we were using event sourcing. So what happened is was when it, the system was ready, we told them, hey, you have your new system ready, and here you have the report of all the, po the potential customers that we think committed fraud on the last three years since the, since the system was running up. So you can imagine the faces of the business people in that case. Because for them, it was like an extra, uh, an extra feature, and they could immediately react and confirm that the patterns were right. So the second, um, the second benefit that we can, could get from these systems is, imagine that we have a, a system that is keeping track of the real estate property. Like, for example, when you rent a house, or when you buy a house, or when you sell a house. Uh, you probably need to pay some taxes, and the taxes depend on the applicable laws at that time. And so the tax office is retrieving all the information and is sending you the tax report. But at some time, maybe the guy or the girl who is receiving that, that information uh, does not agree. So he probably will ask the office manager at the tax office, why is this case? And then you can check the specific events that happened, which laws were applicable at that time when the, uh, the, the owner sold the house and how the laws were applicable. And then you can identify exactly how the process was done to calculate the taxes. So you can explain the process or you can detect some kind of bug in the taxes. But it's kind of trying to do that auditing of the process on how this tax was calculated. And then you have another example. For example, let's say that you have a shopping cart. Again, try to think how this could be related to some other use cases. You have the inventory system, but the inventory probably corresponds to a real warehouse located somewhere. And at some point, the uh, warehouse manager comes and says, hey, the inventory of this product does not match the information that you have on your system, so we have a problem here. Then the only thing that you could do is just check the events that apply specifically for that uh, specific product to see if you see something wrong. If there is no something wrong, the next thing that you could do is you can deploy a new module that is configured to filter only the events applicable for that, uh, for that uh, product. And you can debug the system by getting all the information one by one and see how the inventory was updated to see if you can spot the problem. So you can debug specifically for that specific case that you know caused the problem. So at some point you detect a bug. Let's imagine that you det detect a bug. That means that the bug was on the real uh, module. The detect could also be here, and that's the, the real benefit of having a single source of truth. 
that you can do exactly the same thing on both places. And you can trust that that's every information that you need to recreate any part of your system, no matter where. So the bug is there, you fix the bug, and then you deploy a new module, and you see, you let them, uh, that module, to come up to date, processing all the past events, then you check that the inventory is right, like the balance in my back account, and then you can remove the former, uh, the former module. So in this case, you have solved a bug, you have debugged the system with zero down, downtime uh, time. So finally, why do we need to uh, use seven sourcing? And there is, I have shown you three of them, but there is a bunch of uh, benefits that you can get. And probably you could even trace a lot more benefits from, from using event sourcing. This event sourcing could be business uh, related or technical related. So no matter what, uh, event sourcing is, is going to render benefits no, uh, in, in several places. But, and there's always a bad, there's always a bad. Event sourcing also comes with some traps that we need to be aware of. It's not just setting up, a, setting up a message broker and then sending events and reacting to those events to update my internal state. The first thing is that usually event sourcing does not work only with events. We have seen that we also need to deal with commands and queries. And the thing here is that commands, events, and queries have different meaning, have different semantics in the communication model. And that means that we have then also different routing patterns. Because it's not the same way that we, are, we need to send a command. When we send a command, we actually need to identify just one single consumer. So we need to decide who is the right consumer that is going to take uh, that message. Probably based on a round robin or based on the different instance that we have available, the one that has less workload, so there's some, some work that we need to do there. But still, the producer needs to wait at least for the confirmation that someone received the command and is going to take, that command is going to be taken uh, care of. The events is quite a different semantic because the root pattern is you send the event completely asynchronous and as long as the event has been put in the, in the event bus, you don't need to wait for anything else. All the people all the components that are interested in that event will receive it in the proper time. And queries, it's also have a different routing pattern because you need to know who are the components that have actually the information and you need to route the messages and wait for the response because actually is the important thing here in the queries. The important thing is the result that you are expecting from the consumer. So that means that we usually need several different buses. The first one is the event message that is going to be routed through the event bus with uh, some semantics and routing patterns. We also have commands that need a different treatment. And then we also have queries that have a query message that also needs a response message. So that's basically the three routing patterns that we have for uh, commands, events, and queries. And it's not that simple. It's not as simple as just put a boost there and decide whether it's a topic or a pull list or subscribe, because you will probably want to implement this routing pattern to know which are the specific components that have the information for a query or the component that is going to be, uh, has, the, uh, has less load and will process the command quicker. So actually, we have three communication channels, and these three communication channels means that implement different routing patterns. So actually, this is more likely the kind of architecture that you will have in your event-driven architecture using event sourcing and CQRS. Still, there is uh, an important remark to do. For the message broker, usually you have several different options, and this is something that you need to take in, in, into consideration. Because just a message broker that knows nothing about the messages that they are exchanging, whether they are a command, a message, or an event, or a query, will mean that you need to implement that by yourself. All the routing patterns is something that you need to implement in your client application or in your producer application. That semantics is something that you need to deal with. 
On the other side, you could decide to use a full-fledged enterprise service bus, which has all the kind of information about the structure of the message and what that message means and how it should be handled, but probably way too much. So the message router for this case of scenarios should have just enough knowledge of the different types of patterns and how they should be routed to the right component. So it's, it's, uh, it's better to have a message broker that is specialized for this kind of situations. And the last thing is uh, storing events, because you don't need only to send the events, but you only need to store them. And storing them follow a very specific pattern. Um, in order, when, when we are going to write a new, a new event, we are going to write, we are going to append it to it uh, at the end of the collection. And we are not going to modify that event because that event is immutable. It corresponds to something that has happened in the past. And that's actually another important thing if we want to really trust what happened in the past in order to do some kind of auditing or to try to detect the bug or why the system was corrupt. So this is a very specific pattern. When we are storing, we are storing at the end, and we are not going to modify uh, never any of those events. But when we are going to query, the pattern also follows a very specific thing. We are going to either retrieve all the events in a certain order from the beginning, or we are going to retrieve only specific events for a specific ID. There's no other option that we are going to use. And there is also an improvement that, that you could use is for very long aggregates, you will probably benefit from actually having some kind of snapshotting snap feature that will allow you to not need to go all way back through all the events if you just want to reconstruct the last state. So for this, you could use a regular database, but as the number of events is going to grow, the performance of that regular database is going to degrade because that uh, regular database is taking into consideration a lot of different patterns, both for writing and reading, that you are not going to use. So the performance is degrading. If you're using an event store and a specific design system to follow these patterns, the performance is going to still be the same. And this is something that, for example, Alar Boots, uh, he was speaking here last year, but he had another talk uh, explaining in detail all these things. And at some point, uh, someone in the audience didn't trust him, didn't trust those graphs, because those graphs seem nice. So what he did indeed was he actually run, ran his own benchmarks, and he came with the same uh, result. And actually, uh, we invited uh, that person to our own conference to explain how he recreated uh, this, this benchmark. So it has, it, is, it has more value because it's not us who, who are saying that. So in summary, I'm going to finish. If you want to use event sourcing, you need to use the right tools. Um, basically, the tools mean that you need to rely on a message broker uh, and on an event store. And also, it will be helpful to have some kind of abstraction that will help you to implement those errors without feeling the pain. So the solution, the things that you need to keep in mind is the message broker should have just enough intelligence to deal with the routing patterns accordingly to the different type of messages, but not having too much information about the internals of the, of the different messages. The event store should be optimized for actually the patterns of writing and reading events that are not going to be modified. And the abstraction lawyer should try to uh, allow you to focus on the important things. So for that, there are many tools that you could use. But for example, we have Axon Framework, which is an open source framework that you could use with, uh, with a Sprint or with regular Java applications. And you could use Axon Server. We have an, an open source version. And, uh, and then you could also use the, the enterprise one. Because if you use these tools, I'm not going to lie to you. Building this type of systems, as they are complex, it's not easy. It's easier if you use the right tools, but then you could focus on the real important things, 
which are how we are going to design those components, how we are going to design which are the entities and the uh, messages that are going to be sent. So the design techniques is what is really important here, and you need to master on that. And then if you rely on the right tools, it could be easier. If you are interested in learning a little bit of on DDD, uh, there's a workshop running right now. And, la and luckily for you, you choose to come here, not to the workshop. The good thing is you still have another opportunity because this afternoon, uh, my colleagues Milan and Sara are going to also speak on, on a different way to treat this disaggregate. So I highly you recommend you to, to attend this session. But if you attend any other sessions and you still want to learn something new, uh, we have, for example, uh, several resources that could be useful to dig a little bit more into that. The first one is the Axon Academy. We have three courses, a couple of free courses there, introducing you to how to use DDD Secure as an event sourcing, and another one using the same, but using Axon Framework. Uh, and then we have a bunch of courses that are, have, a, have a price, but if you are really interested in those and you go through the free ones, and want to continue, just ping me on Twitter or Mastodon, or just approach me a little bit later and I will you give you my email address. And if you want to go through all the courses and you have done the, the first two ones, just ping me and I will provide, say, me, say hey, I was attending your Spin.io talk and I'm interested in doing more courses and I will send you a free coupon for the rest of the, of the courses. So we also have a developer portal with all the information and some tutorials and code samples, and we also have a, um, a discuss platform in order to, to help uh, people collaborate. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um,